Please be seated. It's my privilege and my pleasure to welcome all of us to this time of worship here at the Sardis Methodist Church. As we gather in our historic sanctuary, we just uh, ask that, that God would be present with us. Uh, we invite each and every one of you to enjoy a time of fellowship after service as we uh, have our, our monthly fellowship meal and celebrate the birthdays of those who were born in the month of uh, in the month of August. I think those are all of the announcements uh, I have. I will add one thing. You can begin to see how things are coming together out in the front now, and, and, and I just look forward to the time when that's all done and, and we can have a, just a great celebration uh, out there. Uh, so let us, let us pray together. Most gracious and eternal God, as we come to this time of worship, our prayer is that we might know your presence, that we might feel you with us in this service of worship. Lord, pour out your spirit on us. And as you pour out your spirit, may we, may we praise you heartily. And as we praise you heartily, may we know the blessings of being with you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Um, we'll pick a couple of songs and sing them together. So if you've got one that's a favorite of yours, would you please uh, shout it out? How about we start with 717 and we'll sing one verse of that, the first verse. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath looted the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching.
26. Five twenty-six. Oh, that's a good one. What a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> Lord God, we give to you out of that which belongs to you, that which you have given us for the privilege of stewardship. And Lord, we give it that the good news might be proclaimed, that those who are marginalized might be lifted, and Lord, that all might have a saving relationship with Jesus our Christ. Amen. You'd remain standing as we share together our Psalter this morning. 
It's uh, hymn 19, and it's found on page 750 in our hymn book. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. There is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard. In them God has set a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and runs its course with joy like a strong man. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is a great reward. Also, keep your servant from the insolent. Let them not have dominion over me. Please be seated. Let us come to our time of prayer. Lord God, we come today thanking you. We come today thanking you for the love that we have for you, the love that is a reflection of the love that you have for us. And Lord, we come today with a heart of gratitude. Gratitude that you have given us the opportunity to worship you, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, but we also come today with prayers. Lord, we pray for those who face devastating illnesses. Lord, we come today with prayers for those who have lost loved ones. We come today with prayers for those who are not with us today because they travel. We come today with prayers for those who lead the church, that they might be faithful to the truth of the gospel. We come today with prayers for those who lead our governments, that they might be your agents. Lord, we pray for all of these, that they would know your presence, that they would follow your will, that your precepts might be written upon their hearts. And Lord, we also come today saying thank you for this church and the impact that it's had in this community. But we go even further and we say thank you for the impact that it will have. Lord, because you've, you've given us the mission, that you've given us the opportunity to work in the vineyard that is outside of our doors. We stand on the promise that if your word goes forth that it will not come back void. Lord, we say these things and we ask these prayers. We lift them up and we pray now together the words that you gave us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you'd all please stand and let us sing together now our, open, our hymn of preparation number 77, How Great Thou Art.
please be seated. Hear God's word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God saw everything that he had made. And indeed, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. The word of God for the people of God. I want to begin by sharing a word of thanks for a good friend of mine, Dr. Maxie Dunham. And it's his thoughts that God used to provide the foundation for the message that I'm going to share this morning. So let me begin. As Mary and I have had the opportunity to travel across the world, we have seen some phenomenal structures. Most recently, we had the opportunity to stand on the 148th floor of a building that's 160 floors tall, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. It's a freestanding structure that's that reaches more than half a mile to the sky. We've had the privilege of seeing the great pyramids in Egypt, those at Giza and other places, and we've had the privilege of seeing the castles and their gardens at, at Versailles and Peterhof as well. However, these speak to the accomplishments of human and in no way do they compare to the incandescent amazement that one experiences when you stand on the rim of the Grand Canyon. When you see the magnitude of the glaciers and the icebergs that the glaciers spawn. When you see the detail on the wings of a butterfly or the deep hues of the flowers that bloom in the 24-hour day above the Arctic Circle, the deepest purples that, that you can imagine, and the yellows and reds that are themselves almost incandescent. On a clear night, you can stare into the heavens, and the stars speak of the infinite nature of the God that created the heavens and the earth. And of course, I can't leave out the birth of a child. Incandescent, amazing experiences. The singer Mary Martin, to describe her 90-year-old grandmother, used this term, incandescent amazement. What she said is that she lived her life in a revelation of God's greatness, and she saw God's beauty in everything, a flowing stream, the eyes of a child, a song livid lyric, and the list goes on and on. The point that is being made here is that, that we live in a noisy and busy world, and that leads us to the tendency to live life so fast that we never have a chance to experience moments of incandescent amazement. Just so we understand this word incandescent means emitting life, emitting light, passionate and full of strong emotion. Incandescent measurement then, amazement then, is not just what happens within you, but also that which lights you up and overflows and spills to those around you. The Bible begins with the simple, but yet many ways incomprehensible statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Scientists have come up with many theories to describe what happened on that first day. Some of them called it the big boom. Through the ages, poets have sought to capture the essence of in the beginning. The poet Percy Shelley describes the beginning as the day when God first dawned on chaos. 
James Weldon Johnson offered this version, and God stepped out on space, and he looked around and said, I'm lonely, I'll make me a world. And as far as the eye of God could see, darkness covered everything, blacker than a hundred midnights down in a cypress swamp. Then God smiled and the light broke and the darkness rolled up on one side. The light stood shining on the other and God said, that's good. I want you to remember that phrase, that's good. We'll reflect on it later. Another poet expresses it this way, there were no witnesses to what was about to happen. Happen didn't exist. Reality was timeless, permanent. Space didn't exist. The distance between two points was immeasurable. The points themselves could be here or anywhere, hovering and bouncing. Infinity tangled into itself. Suddenly a trembling vibration and ordering began. He didn't say anything about that trembling vibration, but I would call it the voice of God. I think the words of King David from our Psalter this morning offer the best expression. The heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out to all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. But in the beginning is not the beginning of God's story. It's the beginning of our story, the story of humankind and humankind's relationship with God. You see, God is eternal without beginning, without end. You know, I think about this sometime. Has a child ever asked you who made God? Of course, the answer is no one. The Lord himself makes the proclamation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I think about the name that he, that he gave to Moses when Moses asked him, who shall I say sent me? And he simply said, say, I am. There's some significance to that, I am. You see, am is the present tense of the verb to be. And it simply says that, for God, everything is the presence. There is no meaning to time. In the beginning didn't exist until in the words of King David, the Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the ocean in vast reservoirs. Let the whole world fear the Lord and let everyone revere him. For he spoke, for when he spoke, the world began, it appeared at his command. It's important for us to understand the significance of the creative act. And, and I, I, I tell you that, that in the Bible, there is this Hebrew word, bara. It's the word that means to create. And, and the writers of the scripture use it only in reference to God. God is the only one who creates. It tells me that as humans, we don't create. What we do is form things from what God has created. So let's go a step further. God calls creation out of nothingness, and then he rejoices. Six times, once after each dimension of creation, God notes his creation is good. Once again, we need to hang on to what God sees because we have a tendency to see the world as anything but good. Last week in the sermon, I noted that two-thirds of Americans believe that our country is headed in the wrong direction. Suicides reached an all-time high in 2022 when almost 50,000 individuals chose to take their own lives. These trends are an indication of the emptiness, the darkness, and the hopelessness that many in our communities are experiencing. 
Among these are most often those who do not know Jesus or those who feel that God has deserted them. And Paul tells us that we are Christ's ambassadors, that we have the mission of sharing the good news of Jesus with those who don't know him. We have the mission of assuring those who feel that God has deserted them, that God walks with them through all of the dark days of their lives. I want you to note something. I want you to go and read that first chapter of the book of Genesis and take note of this, of the first six creation events. They begin with the words, and God said. However, when it comes to the final event, the creation of the crowning glory of God's creation, and that's you. Let me say that again, the crowning glory of God's creation is you. You see, that one is not distinguished by, and God says, rather it says, then God says. It's an indication that all of that that came before was simply there to support you. It's an indication that you are so special in God's eyesight that nothing will ever be able to separate you from his love and his presence. King David understood those times of darkness and despair. However, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in one of his lowest times, he was prompted to express his incandescent amazement at the presence of God. He wrote these words, If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Night shining like day. Darkness becoming light. Not only does God bring deliverance from darkness, sometimes God reveals himself most vividly in the times of darkness. We may not be able to explain it. We may not be able to understand it. But we can know full well that God is in the midst of everything. And that begs the question, When you have found yourself in that place of darkness, how have you experienced the unexplainable, unexpected peace of God? Let me go a step further, though. The fact that God walks with us does not protect us from the bumps and bruises of life. It doesn't eliminate the struggles and sometimes tragedies of life. Brothers betray brothers. Husbands desert wives, wives desert husbands, good people lose their jobs, teenage girls get pregnant, teenage boys get hooked on drugs or addicted to alcohol, the young die too early, many of the aging experience dementia, hurricanes and tornadoes destroy towns and cities, toxic chemicals devastate neighborhoods. Oil spills destroy beaches and marshes. And I'm sure that if I asked you, you could add many, many more events like these from our common experiences and from your own personal experiences. And yet we come to a passage that says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. You see, what this says to me is that that what God created was perfect. There was no flaw or defect in it. What God proclaimed is that humankind would be Lord over all creation, created in the image of God, created to be eternal. And that's what you still are, created with the right to choose, and choose we did. Choose to disobey God. The Bible says it this way, God said, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
think about this. If all that God saw was very good, it follows that until Adam and Eve disobeyed God, all they saw was very good. As a result, it may not always seem apparent that every part of God's creation is good. But we can always have confidence that God is working out his plan of redemption. A plan that was laid in place before in the beginning. He didn't have a plan B, only a plan A based on his omniscience and his omnipotence. Let the Apostle Paul's words to the Ephesian church. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly places. He chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. To be holy and blameless in his sight. You see, not only was God's creation perfect without defect or flaw, so was God's plan of redemption. Before, in the beginning, God's plan of grace included Jesus hanging on the cross that our sins would be forgiven, that we would be reconciled to God. You and I are beneficiaries of God's plan of grace, and we are also participants in God's plan of salvation. The Bible tells us, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles, so that we can comfort any in trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For us, for you as believers, these are illuminating, encouraging, and challenging words. We should experience incandescent amazement with the thought that the God of all comfort, the God of all grace, walks with us. Martin Luther helps us understand the magnificence of God's gift of grace. All of the many countless blessings which God gives us here on earth are merely those gifts which last for a time. But his grace and loving regard are the inheritance which endures through eternity. In giving us such gifts here on earth, he is giving us only those things which are his own. But in his grace and love towards us, he gives us his very self. In receiving his gifts, we touch his hand. But in his graciousness, regard, we receive his heart, his spirit, his mind, and his will. As we move forward, let us not get caught up in the noise of such a busy world that we miss the incandescent moments of God's presence with us. Along with Mary Martin's grandmother, let us open our eyes to the revelation of God's greatness, to see God's beauty in everything, a, a flowing stream. The eyes of a child. An utterance like that of Wesley, the lyrics of a song that we might hear, and the creation of God that is very good. I submit to you this morning that if we tune into God and open ourselves to seeing what God has done in creation and for us in grace, we will experience more and more moments of incandescent amazement. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of incandescent amazement. Lord, we thank you for the gift of grace that allows us to experience those moments. And Lord, as we move forward, may we take the time May we take the time to spend with you that the incandescence that you have implanted in us might overflow to someone who needs to know you. We pray these things in Christ's name. And God's children all said, Amen.
If we'd stand and sing together now our closing hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. It's hymn number 89. And now to him who is able to prevent us from falling, to him who is able to present us spotless before the throne of Almighty God, may his peace, his power, in the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us both now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> 